Uh, we have you know, put together this amazing group, Trailblazers here from uh, the Philippines to Hollywood to Chicago, or Chicago, whoops. Uh, to <laughs> DC. <laughs> Where am I? We'll What's it. happening? <laughs> um, and that was my mom's laugh, by the way. You're gonna hear it a lot when Joe Coy talks. <laughs> uh, and you guys have made such an impact in, in your, your, your respective fields, and we're incredibly excited that you guys are here today. By the way, I see a lot of pictures. That's good. Take pictures, spread the amazing word of what fantastic accomplishments um, some of these Filipino Americans are doing in their fields, and then make sure that you're tweeting it, and you, the hashtag's up there, White House, F-A-H-M, and it's at White House A-P-I, and I think our handles are in the program. Okay, so I wanted to just very quickly give you a chance to introduce yourself, maybe three minutes, and tell us a little bit about your journey uh, as a Filipino American to get to this table today here at the White House. <laughs> Chef. <laughs> Good. Uh, again, thank you very much, Billy, for inviting me, the White House Executive Chef. It was a long journey to get here, but it was a very amazing journey for me because to become the White House Executive Chef, there were actually 450 candidates. I didn't even know about it. Wow. And uh, of course, they came from all over the United States, and then they dwindled it down to like 20, then it became 10. You know, to make it very simplistic, it became three, and we had a cook-off, and voila, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> that would have made the most amazing reality show. Why aren't we doing this? Well, not now, because we want you to keep the job as many presidents as possible. So how did uh, being Filipino play into that? Did, was there anything that sort of... Uh, I think, like, being Filipino, there's a lot of innate char characteristics in me that we've been kind of been passed on by my mother and my father. My father was an educator, so he very much insisted from very young age that education is very important, so we always have to make sure that everybody studied and studied well. Mom was a great cook, by the way, and that's where I got my cooking from. And I watched growing up how they dealt with each other and how the community, being a part of this whole extended family of Filipinos, have really strengthened us as a community and family. I think that has a lot to do with it. Nice. Mr. Apple, the app. By the way, everyone, you'll be able to ask questions as well. Uh, you can write them on the cards that we were passing out earlier and tweet us. Uh, tweet me, I, <laughs> or, or the White House, uh, at White House AAPI with the hashtag, and we will answer your questions. Cool. But go ahead. First of all, uh, good, um, Good afternoon. Magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. And uh, on my journey on the way here, I didn't know uh, Barong goes well with DC. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and I'm very proud and excited that, you know, our, we're acknowledged by our, our history, our heritage, our culture. So I have two now, because I'm Filipino and black, so, you know. <laughs> um, um, I was born in Philippines uh, in a small town, a small province called Sapang Bato in Angeles City. And um, I come from a, a, a humble beginning. Um, I used to uh, tag along farming with uh, my grandfather. So, uh, you know, if you want s uh, some help in uh, in uh, planting uh, sweet potatoes and uh, and, <laughs> and uh, how to make charcoal, uh, I could help you out with that. <laughs> and uh, you know, um, and uh, my mom found a uh, discovered a foundation called Pearl S. Buck Foundation, and uh, what they do is uh, they get sponsors from the U.S. And um, I don't know, you've probably seen those commercials, you know, help a kid. Give 65 cents a day, and you'll help, you know, help him feed him. And uh, you know, I was in that video, so <laughs> I, I made I made my shirt extra dirty. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and um, you know, <laughs> in ret in return, you get to uh, write letters and uh, and show your grades and um, take photos of all the materials that you you utilize the the money. And, uh, you know, and my dad took interest in me. I would tell my life story, um, you know, I would tell him, um, Dad, I'm sorry, uh, my math grade is low because I have this uh, eye condition called nystagmus. 
I cannot see the board. And so, uh, you know, that kind of that kind of sparked the uh, the adoption. So he brought me to the U.S. in 1989, and um, he was roommate with my best friend, which is my bandmate Will I Am, and um, yeah. he, he needed a babysitter on a weekday. So, uh, uh, you know, Will I Am's uncle was app. You gotta tell him the best part though. Which one the, is the it? first? App didn't know how to speak English. Oh, oh yeah, that's true. And this is how they talk. Will <laughs> goes. Will goes. You know how to dance? And then App goes. I can do the Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how the Black Eyed Peas yeah. was created. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. And now he's here. Yeah, and now I'm and now here. in the White House. <laughs> so uh, that's a true story, by the way. That, that is a true story. You know, Will's like, you, Will, you know, he looked at me like I was from the jungle. He's like, you're from the Philippines? What do you do there? He's like, oh, I do the running man. You know the running man that dance? It's like, I do that too. He's like, yeah, I do that too. I ran f all the way from the Philippines. <laughs> And <laughs> Apple impressed Will by doing the moonwalk and flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, the rest is history. Here I am. I'm still it's like pinching myself moment to be, you know, in from Sapon Bato to the White House. You know, Angela City to the White House. Wow. Hi everybody. How are you? Um, I'm Cassandra Ventura. Uh, most people know me as Cassie. Uh, I was born and raised in New London, Connecticut uh, by my mom, Regina. I actually brought my parents today. Um, my African-American mother and my Filipino-American father. Um, so we're so proud to be here. This is amazing. This is my first time in the White House, so I'm pinching myself too. I'm freaking <laughs> out. Um, I, I started off as a model, but um, you know I found it hard growing up in Connecticut I didn't really identify with a lot of the kids that I grew up with. It was a lot of white kids or black kids, and that was pretty much it. So I was of mixed race, and um, to um, overcome feeling different, I decided to model, which was kind of out of the norm because I was 5'4 and a little bit awkward. <laughs> but um, it all worked out, and after I graduated high school, I moved to New York, and I pursued modeling. and. From there, I started recording music because I, I studied musical theater and dance in high school. So um, from there, I, I created music and I continued to model. Um, and I'm relocating. I, I was told not to say that I'm moving because I'm not moving. I'm relocating to South Africa, to Cape Town, um, oh. as of next week to do my second film this year. So I'm acting, singing, yeah. dancing, trying to do my best. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that sounds yummy in South <laughs> Africa. I want to go there. I've never been there. Mm -hmm. Hi, guys. <laughs> so I love this concept of journey because, you know, it's the only way really you, you trace back your roots and, you know, a certain appreci appreciation. Uh, for me, I was born and raised in a little esquinita, in a little alley in Guadalupe Nuevo, Makati City. And if you are not familiar with the culture of the Philippines, I, you know, we had this fiesta celebrations that happens in the Philippines, right? Where we celebrate, you know, a you know, birthday of a saint. So where I'm from, we have this uh, culture of celebrating uh, Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. And during those celebrations, there would be singing contests, dance contests, and transgender beauty pageants. So that's where I started. I remember when I was five years old when, you know, you know, I was obviously, I, I was assigned boy at birth. And at five years old, I would always wear this T-shirt in my head or blankets. And my mom asked me, how come you always do that? I said, mom, this is my hair. I'm a girl. So that was like the early moments where I really felt like this is who I am. And because there is a point of reference in our culture in the Philippines of those transgender beauty pageants, it wasn't like, a new thing for my mom. Like we could pinpoint, like of course that's who she is. It's funny. I, I I owe so much to that culture of transgender beauty pageants in the Philippines. It was um, it was my second family, and it was my first job. I was discovered by a transgender beauty pageant manager in the Philippines, and I traveled all over the Philippines. I joined beauty pageants where it's literally the back of the truck or like um, in a little rice field in Pangasinan, or like when it rains, you know, someone someone will be fighting in front of us in Batangas with Balisong, you know. 
all of those things I've experienced, but I would also join transgender beauty pageants on national television because it's part of our culture. But what's interesting, I, you know, I started joining transgender beauty pageant between 15 to 17. And a little context in the Philippines at that time, if you're trans, your life, the, the expectations that you would go to Japan, you would become an entertainer, you would become a Japayuki, which is most of my friends would do that. And they would make a lot of money, and then it was a typical story that they would send a lot of money you know, back home to their, to their mom and build houses and, you know, for, for their moms, and you know, they would send a lot of their family members to, to school. And it's like, I want that, so I would rather go to Japan. But then my mom moved to um, United States in 1995, and then in 2001, she told me that my petition came through. So she called me and she said I should move to United States. I didn't want to move to the U.S. because I wanted I would rather be a Japayuki. But then when she told me that there is a policy in California that would allow me to change my name and gender marker on my documents, that was it. I'm moving to California. So I moved to California <laughs> to 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 be recognized as a person that you are in your documents, that was, that was huge for me. That was a life-changing moment for me. You know, for people, it's your driver's license, it's your you know, ID to get a drink, it's my license to live, baby girl. <laughs> 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 so that changed that, and in 2005, I decided I wanted to model, so I moved to New York to be a model, but I also made the decision that I wasn't ready to share about my, my identity as a transgender woman. So I was living this double life. I was living as a model, I was working, I was happy, but at the same time, the next day I would be so afraid because if somebody outed me, like I was afraid that my, my career would be over. After you know, years of doing that, I realized, you know what, enough of that. So on my 30th birthday, my gift to myself is I'm gonna come out. I came out on a TED Talk. It was the first time I, I publicly shared um, about my journey, and since then I've been traveling all over the world advocating for transgender rights, and here I am. <laughs> um, is it on? <laughs> there you go. It <laughs> um, I'm half white, half Filipino. Mestizo uh, <laughs> uh, Very Filipino, patis. <laughs> In the kitchen, <laughs> always Patisse in the kitchen, and I just found out today mm -hmm. that there's Patisse Shh. in this kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my hats off to you for being not only a trailblazer, working three administrations, right, uh, Clinton and, and the Bush and and, and this, uh, 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 this Obama, but <laughs> Patisse in the kitchen the whole time. Um, my mom and dad, uh, you know, they separated, and uh, when they separated, I was raised by my mom. So I took on my Filipino side. Uh, you know, that's what I latched on to. I identified with that family. My, my aunts uh, were the ones that raised me. My mom's the one that kind of stayed involved with the community because uh, that was her only outlet. That was her friends. When back in the 80s, there weren't really uh, that many mixed kids out there. You, you know what I'm talking about, Ab. <laughs> and, uh, and my mom was trying to find Filipino friends in Washington. When she did, she, she, uh, she started uh, getting involved in the community and organizing events. Like when I saw the Philharmonics, man, what you guys are doing, man, we've been doing that since we were 10. <laughs> 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 All right? So don't think you've been doing some new <laughs> stuff, man. <laughs> All right? My mom forced me to beatbox at 10 <laughs> for cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Applewood moonwalk in, the, in his flip flop. So why are we doing this? For the cookies. For the cookies. <laughs> That's real talk, by the way. So I, my mom would put us in every activity, man. Every, every, you guys know, you know what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. We can leave this place right now and someone will go, there's karaoke at my house right now. <laughs> Who wants to go? Who? Who? And everyone will pull out a karaoke. Oh, oh me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but my sister was a singer and, 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 and she started singing. And, and when I, I would go watch my sister sing in Vegas, she did a lot of lounge, you know, a lot of the lounge acts. And, and I would just watch my sister. I always wanted to be a comedian. That was like, I wanted to be Eddie Murphy, you know? And I, and I remember asking my mom, get me a red leather outfit. And she goes, that's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> just wear a T-shirt. 
<laughs> Make it work. Make it work. Uh, that's why you're laughing, huh? She said the same thing to you, huh, Bill? Yeah. Um, nothing better than Filipino moms. They're the most honest women in the world, boy. They will tell you. They will tell you right off the bat. How do I look? Ugly. Why? <laughs> That's how you look. You want the truth or do you want me to lie? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyways, my mom, my mom is the one that kind of pushed my sister and I both in entertainment. And this is back in the day, like in the, in, you know, like in the 80s, you know? And, and so I didn't have that many role models. You know, I saw Lou Diamond Phillips, you know what I mean? I saw <laughs> Tia Carrer, and I mean, those are the people I latched onto, and as far as stand-up was concerned, I, I had Margaret Cho, and I had Henry Cho, and that's all I had, and I was just like, man, I wanna do stand-up, like I was so in love with stand-up, and, and I remember watching the Apollo, this is back in the day, you guys, all right? The Apollo is when <laughs> you would go up, and then if you bombed, they had a guy that would tap dance and sweep you off, and everyone would boo you off the stage. And that was that. That was the Apollo back then. They don't have it now. Well, I won that. I won the Apollo doing stand-up. Yes. And, and that was kind of like, that kind of like solidified it for me. I was like, yo, I'm ready to do stand-up. Like, if I can do the Apollo, I can do anything. And I and and I, I took that 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 route, man. I just started going for it, man. I went on from uh, taking on my mom's hat because my mom would always organize things. Like she when she would do these uh, events, you know what I mean? Like the Filipino, uh, uh, you know, the Filipino uh, Christmas parties and the uh, Easter events, all that stuff. My mom was always organizing, having us uh, perform. She'd always go, "I have the entertainment." And it was just my sister and I. <laughs> that was it. No one else. <laughs> Is Rico, J is Rico J. Puno going to be there? No, uh, but Joseph will be there. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, but I saw how my mom would organize things, and when I started pursuing comedy, you know, I wasn't getting, uh, like, I wasn't getting booked. No one was giving me a shot. So I went and started, you know, I started renting theaters on my own, and I started ripping tickets. I got tickets still <laughs> at my house. I got flyers that I made by myself at Kinko's. We didn't have... Computer. I keep looking at you guys like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so angry at you guys. <laughs> we were pitch perfect. <laughs> no, but I'm just, no, I'm not, it's out of love. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> all I'm saying is uh, well, I had to go out there and do that, man. I had to make these flyers. I went and got sponsors, and, and, and my mom is the best because she sold the most tickets. <laughs> so that's it. This Follow stuff. that, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go under and below. Uh, I, I, I grew up in a small town, Cavite City. It's, it's about two hours away from. Oh, Caviteños, Caviteños. I grew up there, and it's two hours away from from Manila. It's right next to an American naval base at Sangley Point. So I was very close to the U.S. because, uh, but you can't really go inside that base. It's, it's, it's a military installation. They don't, they don't let anybody in. And I, I watch TV, I watch cartoons a lot. I loved cartoons. I, I loved watching The Wonderful World of Color and what I wanted to do was to draw all day and all night and on my notebooks. My dad would discover them and get disappointed in me. And he would tell me, it's like, you gotta take your study seriously, son. Drawing is just a hobby. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, chills the drawing, so you kind of have to do it. You're hiding it most of the time when I'm drawing. And, and I'm the only nerd in my city. I don't have anyone to talk cartoons with or comic books with or reading sci-fi novels. I was a nerd. I was, I was the only nerd that I've known for years. You hear that, you guys? Original <laughs> nerd. nerd. You ain't got nothing on this. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so uh, that being the case, it didn't it didn't feel it didn't feel right that when you were a kid you would watch the Wonderful World of Disney and then Walt would say come to Disneyland and I would ask my mom and my dad like can we go can we go and my mom and dad would say yeah 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 but then you get older they get tired of saying yeah yeah you know they have to kind of cop to it it's like no we're not ever gonna go to Disneyland why because we can't go there we're in another country. Another country? 
because all the programming back then were only about three or four channels. There's a lot of American programming. I watched a lot of American TV. I would ape everybody on TV. And I kind of thought that because there's an American naval base right over there, well, Disneyland must be somewhere over there. <laughs> <laughs> but they had to tell me that we can't go there. I th in fact, we won't ever go there because by the time I started realizing that, there was turmoil in the country. Then martial law happened. Nobody can leave. And with that, my father lost uh, all his money in a very bad business venture. Uh, uh, um, a partner of his made off with all the funds. And we were destitute and very poor for a very long time. Uh, after graduating uh, high school, I didn't go to college. I went to work. My very first job my sister got me was to work at Apocalypse Now. But I was a grunt. I mean, I was the guy that the, the painters' divisions would actually make me do all the crap jobs just to get me out of their hair because I don't know anything. But since after that, I also worked a lot of odd jobs and I couldn't even get to school. My dad took a long shot to go to the U.S. on a, on a working visa that was kind of on his last legs. He migrated, he worked about three or four jobs, sent us money, and I didn't see him for about 11 years. 11 years. And then my mom went, and then my sister went, and all three boys left to the Philippines. We tried to, we went to school. I went to college when my friends were already graduating from college. I, I, I went to a College of Fine Arts in UST, and yeah. <laughs> then the petition arrived. You can go now. But by that time, I already have kids of my own, and I have my beautiful wife here with me. We met in school. And I wasn't even sure if I was going to go because I don't want to, I don't know about being an artist in the U.S. But I went, I wanted to try it out, at least for a couple of months. If not, I'll go back home. But I got lucky. There were friends that I had made in the industry of just drawing that says you should be in animation. I said, like, I don't know anything about animation. They didn't study it. But they actually said, you should go. I actually liked being in animation. Even, and I learned on the job. I, I, I got a job. Uh, 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 doing Batman animated series. So that was comic books, it was kind of sci-fi, and I was drawing, I was very happy. I went and did all the, uh, the, the 2D uh, anima animated features from DreamWorks because somebody told me to go there, and I went and they hired me, and I became a, a story supervisor there. And then when the pinnacle, the, the Mount Olympus of animation is Pixar. Nobody gets hired there because it's outside of Los Angeles, but I threw in my portfolio, and they said yes. And when they said yes, the first movie I worked on was Finding Nemo. And they, they uh, Andrew Stanton promoted me to be one of the heads of story. Uh, I, I worked on Wally, and then Pete Docter uh, said that uh, I want you to work on this movie about an old man who wants to float his house with balloons. Uh, as I was like, sure, the paychecks don't bounce. This is great. I did that. I was the head of story the, on that one. And then um, this summer, uh, I am the co-director to my director, Pete Doctor, on Inside Out. And it's been a long, <laughs> thank you. It's, it's been a long journey from a kid who actually got told that drawing doesn't really quite matter and you should watch out for it. And from a country that, that wasn't connected to Disneyland, I actually am here. So I'm very honored to be amongst everybody here and, and all of you. Amazing. Okay, so uh, I hope you're getting your questions in and you're tweeting your questions to us. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you all one uh, kind of quick question. Uh, Chef, so you have started at the White House Kitchen in 95, so first of all, happy 20th anniversary. <laughs> your amazing representation. <clears throat> we know you've cooked uh, dinners for kings and queens and heads of state. Uh, <laughs> we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think everyone else would like to know. Uh, have you cooked Filipino food for the president? Perhaps Kamayan style. And <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm not kidding. Uh, and, and what does it mean to be the first Filipino-American chef for three presidents in the White House? Those are very good questions. And you know, I'm going to answer first the last one, you know, being the first female minority person of color, non-European chef of the White House. It was big. I didn't realize it until, you know, the news came out, I was actually in Mexico, and uh, the press office told me like, please be hush about this, don't tell anybody, 
And of course, I'm not going to tell my mom because Filipino moms, why don't you tell yeah. one? The whole country <laughs> knows. Oh, I know. It's Mine's right there. Yeah. So I, I, I cannot tell my mom at all. You know how hard that was. I just want to say I told my mom not to tell anyone. She's sitting next to all her high school friends. Yeah. She brought. <laughs> so basically what happened was that they announced it on that Monday. Supposedly the press would come out. But, you know, I, you know, I was kind of like, okay, I'll tell them Monday morning when it comes out. But, of course, Sunday night it was all over CNN. You know, the White House hires, hires the first female executive chef. And you know, it was kind of like the Finding Nemo thing. You know, what it was so great, but then I felt like those little fishes in the tank, that you know, they got out of the tank and they were so happy and then they were like jumping into the Sydney Harbor. When they got there, what was the question? He, he just drew it. He, he doesn't write it. Right. I'm sorry. I don't know to you. He just, why are you stumping <laughs> okay. him right now? We didn't do that to you. Come what on. kind of knives in the kitchen? I forgot. Now what, Andrew, now what? Exactly. Now what <laughs> was <laughs> was the biggest question that, you know, was... Are you asking or are you just telling her? No, that's actually... That, oh, okay. That's 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 act okay. So going back, that was the question. Now what? It was great. <laughs> it, it really basically broke a lot of glass ceilings. It was... I mean, okay, my picture is at the Smithsonian postcard that they were, like, sending out to people. That's how big it was. So you could go to the, the Asian American Institute, and it's there. So you go to the Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, I guess, museum. I mean, it's all over the museums. And I never would have thought, growing up in Catalonia, Sao Paulo, that I would end up where I am right now. And it's not over yet, so, no, no, you know. Hey, so. Yeah. No. <laughs> Amazing. So Amazing. Okay, what was the first question again? I forgot. Have you cooked Filipino food for the president? Does he like it? And has he ever eaten kamayan? Okay. <laughs> One of those questions will be fine. Uh, are you ready for the answer? Yes. I cannot really divulge any kind of private <laughs> eating, but I'm just gonna like wink. <laughs> <laughs> that and Joko, I think, just oh. out of you. Oh. <laughs> a wink means adobo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but he, he's such a cool guy to cook for because he's very open to a lot of different cuisines. I mean, he grew up in Hawaii, yeah. Indonesia. Yeah. He's yeah. a very well traveled person. He loves being surprised. So, as a chef, it's not just a great challenge for me, but a great opportunity to share my roots, but at the same time, share everything of other people's root too, because I have to be inclusive of everyone. So you made him a dobro? <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, uh, that's secret service right there. Go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and get out of there. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to you, Apple. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I can ask you a million questions about Black Eyed Peas. I almost don't need to because it's internationally known. I mean, what an amazing accomplishment. You co-founded this group that's won a billion Grammys and performed at the Super Bowl and, and traveled all around the world. Um, but I think what's really interesting is that you uh, have these really amazing charitable and philanthropic um, causes that you stick to. And I've seen you go back to the Philippines. I've seen you do this stuff. Uh, and, and can you just talk about that very quickly? Yeah, so um, after being adopted and I was able to go back home after a decade later, and you know, I would just, I just started seeing the discrepancy of the education, the, kid, the, the, the kids in my neighborhood. So uh, when I went back to the States, uh, we, went, we went on tour, and uh, I was in Ireland, and it was an after Black Eyed Peas party, and I called my mom, and uh, I was like, you know, very passionate. It's like, Mom! For Christmas, I'm gonna go home, bring 25 laptops, and you need to buy this building so I could put it there so all the kids in the neighborhood could go there and learn computers and open up information. And she's like, Anak, are you drunk? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was like, okay, that's beyond the point. That's beyond the point. Um, so um, I started uh, the Apple the App Foundation three years ago, and, uh, and uh, my main advocacy is education. I've, Build over uh, 34 classrooms, uh, uh, computer labs, and a uh, uh, music studio. And uh, in two weeks, I'm going to Davao because uh, uh, I'm uh, delivering this equipment for premature uh, uh, babies because uh, they, you know, they get uh, retinal detachment 
to op something about retinal detachment if you, it's not if it's not diagnosed in 48 hours. So I'm delivering uh, these uh, equipment in two weeks in Davao and uh, other provinces in the Philippines. So uh, it's uh, it's been uh, it's you know other than the, all the acolytes, this is what makes me tick is. Uh, giving other kids opportun uh, opportunity because I was one of those kids, so I'm just paying it forward. So uh, uh, it's just a <laughs> very, it makes me really <laughs> joyful and happy. Excellent. Um, so Cassie, uh, question, uh, what's, what's it like to be one of the very few Filipino Americans you know, doing well in the music and, and, and acting industry? And, and how can we increase Filipino representation as a community in the entertainment field? Well, it's definitely an honor <laughs> to be considered that um, because I started at a really young age and I worked extremely, extremely hard to get where I am now. Um, and, you know, as you said, it, it's not over. Everything is still happening and I feel like I'm in the middle of it right now. Um, but I feel like for me personally, putting yourself in the position to have those opportunities is the best way to, you know, increase what what did you say the, uh, the representation in the community? So, um, you know whether it's going to different music conferences or interning for you know executives, whatever it is, put yourself in the position to be there. Um, I've been living in Los Angeles for the past three years, and it kind of opened my eyes to there's a huge Filipino community in uh, California, so I've been working with other uh, fellow peers that are Filipino, uh, whether it's fashion design, <coughs> um, music and studio, and I think just encouraging each other, staying on top of encouraging each other and um, publicly supporting each other, ultimately, yeah. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> yes, pulling each other up is a big. So Gina, um, as many of us know, transgender issues have received a lot of attention lately, especially with uh, Caitlyn Jenner, um, and, and actually we're on I Am Kate, I heard, yes. yeah. We've um, become great friends. Yeah, can you talk crazy. a little bit about your transgender uh, advocacy efforts, and have you ever felt obstacles um, in the Filipino community? Because it sounded quite supportive. Thank you. Yeah, it's really complicated stuff. Well, first, I, when I did, um, when I gave a TED talk, um, and when that talk came out, went viral, and I launched a, a global advocacy campaign, it's called Gender Proud, Advocating for Transgender Rights. And initially, we wanted to go in different countries, but the, the thing that made sense for me is I need to go back to the Philippines. This is where I'm from. This is this is my culture, this is my family. So I went back there, and um, most recently this May, we traveled in three different cities, in Quezon City, Cebu, and Vigan. And during those uh, different um, places that we visited, you know, we, we did um, LGBT talks, but most importantly, we did this workshop called Media Training and the Power of Storytelling. And I think that's really important. What you're saying about representation, like for the longest time, this identity being trans has been erased. It's been looked as, as something that's nothing to be celebrated for. Especially in the Philippines, there's this huge confusion of this word called bakla and trans. And uh, even those two words are two separate things. I remember the first time I went to the Philippines and all the journalists wanted to, you know, to do an interview, whether it's Karina Sanchez or anybody, right? And the thing that I always wanted to make sure is that like, th you have to address me a certain way. If you want this interview, this is the way we're gonna talk about it. You can't talk about you know, my former name, you can't address me as a boy, address me as the woman that I am right now. Because I work so hard to be where I am right now. <laughs> so it really has been quite a journey and after you know, going back to the Philippines and advocating for specific policies that's in the Philippines, I think really the most important to meet all these amazing transgender communities, indigenous transgender communities in the mountains to transgender deaf communities that are like living their lives. I mean, these people are, the, the, they're the ones that inspires me. So after that, um, the work that we did there, I got back and then the Vanity Fair came out with Caitlyn Jenner and I got a phone call and said, you know, I'm doing this show, we want you to be part of it. And uh, I think in a way for me, because I didn't know, you know, the, the whole story of Bruce and what, what that was. So for me, I, I was just looking at her as a person who have spoken her truth 
And what's more powerful than that? You know, for the longest time, she's living this life and just really wanted to be herself. And it really has been quite a journey. But I think what's the most important thing is this. We see this visibility that's happening right now in conversations and people think like, of course we've achieved equality. It is far from it. Caitlyn Jenner's story, I love her. It's one story. The transgender community is a very diverse community. She's also s you know, coming from a point, from a, a, a person of privilege. This is not the experience of most transgender people. Nobody could afford surgeries, nobody could afford this house, nobody could afford employment, you know, to, to get to that point. I mean, we were talking about housing in 32 states, you know. Transgender people could be discriminated. Like, if I want to rent in, in those 32 states, I could be denied because I'm trans. That's where we're at. We're far from it. And sp specifically, I love working with transgender youth because they need to know that their lives will be better. They need to know that hopefully, you know, the stuff that we've gone through that they don't need to go through anymore. Like right now in, in, in homelessness, 40% of homeless youth are LGBT identified. Most of them gets kicked out of their house because their family does not want them. I have been so, so lucky to have a family that accepted me and celebrated me. I remember I was giving this, this interview, um, I, I think it was a Glamour magazine interview, and the reporter was asking my sister, did Gina ever come out when she was young? And my sister was like, I don't remember sh her coming out. She just kept on like playing with those Barbies, and, and every time we take it out, you know, she just cry, and like, you know, who doesn't, who, you know, we don't want her to cry. We want her to be herself. So that love that I've been given with my family, I just want to share that and give back to the community. That's been so, so wonderful for me. And I think just fully circle, uh, at least in this moment where we're having this conversation about this transgender identity. People think it's a new thing. It's a new trend. I mean, we will look back in this moment and this specific conversation will define uh, our understanding of gender, that it's not just about being male or female, and it's not. I mean, and I, and I trace it back to our Filipino culture. Before Spain got to the Philippines, we have this culture of babaylan. Do you guys know about babaylan culture? They're the spiritual leaders or, or gender fluid cultures. They are, before Spain got to the Philippines, we've understood gender as not just being male or female. So this is nothing new, and it's same thing to every single nation before colonization in the United States. Native Americans have always known about this called Two Spirits. So we will look back in this moment having this conversation to truly redefine how we understood gender, and hopefully within those conversations, when we're changing culture, when we're having representation, when we're changing policies, that we will look back, of course these things make sense and hopefully the young kids would, n would not have to go through what we've gone through. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Joe, first of all, shout out to the Hapas. I'm half, <laughs> just like you with a Filipino mom that I just, yep. and so I love all your jokes, or not jokes, but just the way in which you tell your stories about your Filipino mom. Yeah. I do too, mm -hmm. there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, mom, I won't tell one right now. Um, so, or should I? No. Uh, what I love about, and I'm incredibly impressed about, uh, about you is you have really thrived throughout the mainstream. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. With much story that you would think only we would understand. How has it, how has the American uh, mainstream <coughs> really sort of, you know, latched onto you? When, I, when I first started stand-up, like, um, I, I would do that whole that whole uh, thing where I set up the joke by saying, uh, well, where's my Filipinos at? And then I'm like, well, you guys aren't going to get this. Filipinos do this and blah, blah, blah. And then I noticed I was like noticing people in the audience going, well, I didn't really get it. You know, we got it. And I, and I didn't like that. I didn't like mm -hmm. that separation. So I started just telling the story of my mom, like becoming the character on stage as my mom instead of saying, hey, Filipinos – eat rice like this, mm. like, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like my yeah. mom always <laughs> ate her rice with her hand and put it in my mouth, and then she's like, Joseph in front of my friends, hey, eat like that, and my friends were like, what are you doing, why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> There's forks, man. <laughs> and, but I've noticed that if I just tell the story about my mom, then people will just identify with the mom's story, like, you know what I mean? Like when I talk about losing my keys, 
and my mom's not helping me. She's just standing behind me going, oh, you lost it again, huh? <laughs> where, where did you put it? Like that? Everywhere? <laughs> And, and then when I started doing that, I st started noticing more people coming up to me going, yo, my mom does that to me too. <laughs> Instead of helping with my keys, she just makes fun of me always losing my keys. So I always wanted to just tell the stories of my mom, you know what I mean? And just and let the, the crowds relate. Like no, no matter what color you were, white, black, Latino, uh, Asian, it didn't matter. Moms are moms. No matter what color you are, it's just that's what moms do. So I think that's why people identify with it. You know what I mean? Like when my mom was playing Wii with me and calling me out, like, you don't have a tennis game like that, <laughs> Jose. <laughs> <laughs> and then I noticed other people were coming up to me, my mom does the same thing with the Wii. And, uh, and, uh, and it just started happening. It was, it was organically. I just liked talking about my mom. I liked becoming the character on stage. And, 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 and you know, now it's like, you know, I'm, you know I was in Nashville. Like mm -hmm. last night, I'm, I'm taping a show in Nash Nashville. And, and, I, and, and you know, I got the Warner Theater tonight. And then I'm flying back to Nashville because I have two shows in Nashville. Not one Asian's gonna be there, not even a Filipino. <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of rednecks going, say Joseph. <laughs> say Joseph, man, right now. <laughs> and, and to me, that makes me happy, man. That's funny. <laughs> My mom's popular in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> All right. um, <laughs> oh, and by the way, <laughs> I want to. I do want to shout you out, uh, Apple. I, I want to say this because this is my this is my best friend from from way back, man. Like on the tour bus, with the Black Eyed Peas when I first met App, and, and Fergie goes, "Yo, this guy loves stand up, and uh, he's got all the videos. He's got he's got Eddie Murphy, he's got Richard Pryor, but all he listens to is this one. And then he's like, "I love it. Want to watch it? And it's my DVD. So he was watching. He was watching that on the on the on the tour bus. So everything this man does, I'm always right by him. So uh, way to support. I love you, man. Yeah. I bought a school for you. You know that, right? <laughs> so don't, yeah, don't actually even yes. shout that out. Yes, that's real talk. Actually, uh, a Joker invited me in Vegas, and uh, he donated all the proceeds to build a school in Philippines. So oh, nice, nice. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, so Ronnie. Uh, you know, you, you've made some of the most iconic movies ever. Uh, w wondering, will, will we ever see a Filipino-American character featured in a Disney or Pixar film, do you think? And if so, when would that be? <laughs> and can you cast me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we cast <laughs> Transgender? Yeah, Pixar transgender, oh. a transgender couple. I'm taking notes. Perfect. I, I think that's going to win a lot uh, of awards. A lot right? of awards. Right? Right? I mean, if it's going guy, yeah. to be social media <laughs> voting, right? I mean, <laughs> Filipinos will be. Yes. Just saying. Very good. Just court. saying. I already have his card, so we're good to go. <laughs> I don't have a card. Oh, I can give you a card. There, I'll get you I another one. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer that question. Uh, uh, first off, I got to go. I put one thing that I didn't mention is like, I actually migrated in this to the States 1989 as well. So it's. Yeah. Nine. We probably bumped kind yeah. of like suitcases right, and x ray right. charts. <laughs> yeah. Did angels. you have a sign? I had a sign. I like had a sign? <laughs> Pick this kid up. <laughs> <laughs> back, back then, you, you have to have a giant x ray with you as you. As you, you guys, who did that? It was a giant, yeah, exactly. Giant x rays. I don't know why, just to make sure you didn't carry an alien inside you. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, I'm so proud to be part of, of, of Pixar and Disney. In, because the, the company is very diverse. Uh, one earmark of that is that in, in, at Pixar, we have a, a, a group uh, of all, all Filipino Americans that were called Pixnoids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Pixnoids. So we get together, we get a potluck, so we can eat pancit and adobo and all that. But we're, 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 we're the jolliest uh, group at Pixar because we're always smiling. They always say, it's like, oh, Filipinos, you guys are always smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But uh, we are. Uh, but My we mother told me to smile. To always smile. <laughs> <laughs> but we also actually uh, 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 kind of like get together and have um, a charitable uh, event when we have auction out artwork, original artwork. Uh, I'll, I'll let you guys know if we're having one, so please call in with your bids because yeah. original artwork from actual Pixar artists, uh, you can own one. It's actually affordable. 
but they, they all worked on these amazing movies and you can have original art. So that's my little pitch. And as for diversity, because the company actually has uh, a, a lot of uh, people from all over the world. It, 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 the, the company hires the best employees. They are, are race blind, color blind, and ideology blind. The, the, the thing about Pixar I love is that when they actually welcomed me and I was very intimidated because it felt like this is the most exclusive animation club ever. They, they, they're notorious for not hiring people who are like luminaries in the industry and they let me in. But once I got in, I got welcomed by the company and I met so many different people who f a lot of them don't speak different languages. But not only that, the, the, the company wants to push for more diversity and then more, uh, more diversity than any company I've ever worked for. But not only that, because of in terms of stories, all of the people at Pixar give notes to our movies. That means that when we're making the movies, we make story reels, we actually try and find out if our movie's working. The entire company watches the movie, and the entire company gives notes. So we will find out if our movie works or not. We, we screen about five or seven different times improving the movie. Everybody can give a note so that everybody can weigh in on how this movie is doing. And that means that all of those voices get represented there. But not only that, all of the people who are manning the stations making the movie is a very diverse group, and all of us have a voice in making the movie. So it's a community that makes it. And because of our hiring policy is very diverse and because of the, the way that we make our stories is very diverse, it seems like all of our voices get represented in our movies. And a story that may feature a Filipino-American or a, a, a transgendered character, Thank I don't think that's, that's too far behind or far-fetched because it is that kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to look to one or two of you guys to answer this one. There's a lot of divide and challenges within our community. As some know, uh, a lot of times we don't always support each other. We're not always connected, and that's a, that's a shame. Um, and you are uh, getting a ton of support, but that kind of only happens whether by coincidence or, or whatever, once the mainstream media celebrates you. For people that are trying to break in, and gain the support of the community. Do, you, does, do any of you guys have any advice to, to do that, to gain the support of the local Filipino American community um, to help you get to the mainstream celebratory s level? Apple, come on. Oh, look, <laughs> I'm still waiting for the hookup, man. <laughs> and, <laughs> and by the way, that was one of the questions that were sent in from uh, an audience member. Um, I think um, really just reaching out. Well, for me, I always try to encourage, uh, you know, second gen, third, to really maintain their connectivity even back home, back home in, in the Philippines, you know what I mean? Uh, share ideas, platform, and, and business ideas. And for us Philams that are here, I think we just all need to collaborate, you know? Me and Joe Coy got some stuff uh, coming up. Yeah, we uh, do. Yes, we got we got a video and a song together. So, what? yeah, <laughs> I actually made good. I actually made Joe Coy rap, you know, and uh, and uh, it's a very uh, very funny song. So I think it's all about reaching out and uh, collaborating with other freelancers, and also. Don't be ashamed in representing yourself. Say you're Pinoy out there, you know. There's a couple of people that don't do. And, I th and just, you know, don't just represent yourself. You know, when, when I was uh, coming up in the music, you know, it didn't matter. I was, you know, Queen Latifah came up to me. It's like, I like that song, Bebot. And I was like, oh, you mean Bebot. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, so I sing, you know, I sing Bebo to, uh, you know, white people. They're like, hey, I like it. I like the, the rhythm. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not ashamed. So uh, <laughs> I think it's just collaborating and uh, representing your culture and who you are. All right. Um, real quick, I just want to go down the road. Uh, we're, we're wrapping up. Um, you get to each say one role model into the microphone as you go down that sort of inspired you to get to where you are, just the name. You want to start with you, Chef? Sure. Erlinda Pasha. It's my mom. That's everyone's okay. role model. <coughs> yeah.
就贵。啊<笑>、oh, ，What？ What？ 哦，哦 ，My God！ 哇！ I'm taking back. I am taking back. I got two, Christina Pineda and Stevie Wonder. So that's my mother. Yes. You took mine. I was going to say Stevie Wonder too. No, we're just kidding. I definitely. Sorry to copy you. I have to. I have to say my father. He's been a firefighter for how many years, Dad? In the New London, how long? Thirty-eight years. Wow. And. He used to travel with me when I was modeling, and because he would have three days on, three days off, so we spent a lot of time together when I was a kid. But um, definitely, my dad. I have many things. Mom, definitely, she's been my shero of my story. Um, Oprah, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, transgender youth, you know, they're rock stars. They're these kids, you know, I love right. being with them because they're just so amazing being themselves. Joy. Um, I'm going to just say my mom, uh, she sold the most tickets. <laughs> <laughs> she did. I, can I just do one quick story? I saw I sold this one theater that I rented out and, and it was like 600 seats. And this is like 20, by the way, this is my 26th year in stand up. I started in 89. And, uh, and the theater that I rented, she, uh, it was sold out. And then uh, come to find out, my mom sold all the tickets <laughs> to all her friends. But she, she wrote the check to me. <laughs> Uh, all, for all the tickets. So I don't even think she sold the, the tickets. I think she just gave it to her friends and <laughs> how much was that? All right, here you go, Joseph. <laughs> Good job. So I love you, mom, and thank you so much. Yeah. Oh my God, here. Oh, I got one. Two microphones. Right. Right. It's, it's my mom and my dad because their perseverance through all the hardship, uh, really the, the, the family was so, uh, we were so poor and, and there were, didn't seem any to be any way out of it. If it wasn't for them um, staying together and then trying to keep the family together and, and doing a lot of these long shots, Hail Mary passes, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have the career that I have if, if we didn't get to the US. So I, they're my role models. Oh, one more thing. Okay. Joe Coy. Oh my <laughs> God, thank you. Actually, my adoptive father, Joe Ben Hudgens, I want to thank him so yeah. much for bringing me to the Philip here to the Philippines. Uh, and I'm gonna just jump in and say my mom as well, just to jump in. Happy birthday, mom. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, with that, I think we are wrapped. Uh, let's give a big round of applause to everyone up here and everyone that participated today.